Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you all for joining us tonight with, for what promises to be a very rich and spirited discussion. And I say that because in planning this event, we've had many rich and spirited discussions uh, around how to frame the topic, how to address this topic. And the recurring theme as we start discussing this with any depth is, well, what do you mean by that term? What do you mean by sustainability? What do you mean by ESG? What do you mean by impact? So to set the stage for our conversation, we have provided you some definitions. So if you look at the second page of your handout, you'll find a glossary of key terms provided for your reference. And as we'll have the discussion over the course of, of this evening, we'll be coming back to these terms. Our panelists will have different views about how to apply them, how to interpret them. But we thought it would be valuable as a starting point to have some shared vocabulary around what we're talking about this evening when we speak, speak about ESG investing and public funds. Uh, so it's the second sheet of your handout that has a table uh, of terms, the definition, and the source. And I'll share just a few of these uh, by way of background and to, to set the stage for our later conversation. So when we speak of ESG, what we mean are environmental, social, and governance considerations, factors, criteria. All of these terms are used in, in the literature describing ESG, but it, it's the E stands for environmental, the S sounds, stands for social, the G stands for governance. So ESG investors look at these criteria when they're making investment decisions. There's a broader term that you'll find later in the sheet around socially responsible investing. So many understand socially responsible investing to be a broader practice. The term has been used for longer than ESG. Uh, and the definition that we have here, which is provided uh, by Ron in one of his papers, is that socially responsible investments are investments whose primary purpose is to generate financial returns that are consistent with certain values. So the purpose is return, but it's designed to be consistent with values. That's at least one definition of what we mean by socially responsible investing. Uh, if we move on in, term, in terms of some, for some of the other key terms we have here, uh, another term is, sent, is uh, sustainable invest, investments. Now, the event, of course, tonight is co-sponsored by the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. So that's important that we define what we mean when we say sustainable investment. And that is investment that contributes to and does not undermine sustainable development. A framework for considering impacts on sustainable development could include the Sustainable Development Goals and by incorporation, human rights principles. So there we have uh, a definition offered around sustainable investing. And what I'd highlight also, and you, you can see later when you look at the terms, is the very important distinction between what would be called negative screening and positive screening. So simply put, negative screening is when investors decide on things that they do not want to invest in, and they apply those rules, and after those rules are applied, everything is fair game and they'll invest uh, for their objectives, their, their commercial objectives thereafter. So that's what you call negative screening, and we provide a definition for that. Positive screening is the reverse, where investors say, I particularly want to find companies that are, say, well-governed, or carbon neutral, or employ underprivileged people, and I will make a, a positive decision to, to particularly screen for those companies. That's a fundamental difference in practice, as I'm, our panelists can highlight, and I'm sure many of you in the audience will appreciate how different those two postures are. So one is of saying, let me rule out things that I don't want to invest in. Another is saying, let me identify factors that I want to positively screen for. And the practice that comes into that uh, differs very substantially. And in closing, in, in terms of definitions, uh, we offer the, a couple of terms here. One is on impact investing which is very popular on campus. We have a club on impact investing. Is anybody a member of the Impact Investing Club? Okay, we'll have to work on, oh, there you go. Excellent, so we have a couple of members here. So impact investing, at least as generally understood, uh, refers to investments made in companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate a measurable, benefic a measurable beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a financial return. So that's a positive screening, generally where you're saying that you want to measure financial impact and social outcomes, and you're seeking to maximize one or the other or both, but certainly that's a, there's a positive posture there uh, for, uh, for impact. So this evening, our panelists uh, will help us think through questions of ESG investing, particularly as they apply to public funds. And 
the Richmond Center, as was explained, sits at the intersection of business uh, law and policy. So we're interested in seeing where these interact and that's what prompted us to do this. Our partners in the Center uh, for Sust on Sustainable Investment, of course, are also very interested in questions of policy and public good in addition to the questions of what it means to invest sustainably. So that's what brought us to this discussion and I'm very glad that we have our two esteemed panelists with us. Uh, we'll have a few rounds of discussion amongst the panelists uh, and certainly reserve time for your comments, your questions, your input. So we wanna make sure we, we leave time for that. Uh, and as you're well aware from her bio, Carol uh, is the network manager for UNPRI, the, uh, the Principles for Responsible Investing. So she deals with both asset owners and asset managers who are committed to responsible investing and, and signatories uh, to their principles. So she's very close to this space. Uh, so let me start by asking Carol these terms that we've laid out. And of course, your, your signatories commit to principles for responsible investing. So what does that mean to you as an organization? What does it mean to your signatories? Absolutely. Yeah, and um, you know, as we've said, there are a host of different terms out there. Sometimes we refer to the, uh, the alphabet soup of responsible investing. Uh, and, and needless to say, um, having all of this uh, differing terminology out there can really conf create confusion and misunderstanding. Um, but you know, talking through some of the, the terms that we've, we've mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, social responsible investing and impact investing really are approaches uh, to values aligned investing uh, versus what we would refer to as value investing. And it's really for investors that are wanting to invest in line with their values based on moral or ethical considerations. Uh, for example, they might not want to be complicit in the activities of a certain type of company for example, a weapons or a cigarette manufacturer, um, or for, uh, in the case of impact investing, uh, investors that are wanting to combine a financial return with some measurable social impact. You'll also sometimes hear that referred to as double bottom line investing. So, you know, values aligned investing often does imply that you're limiting the investable universe. And that does have implications for the risk return dynamics of your portfolio, uh, not necessarily implying that the performance will be worse, um, but that it will be different. Um, for those who are not familiar with the PRI, which is the organi organization that I'm the senior US network manager for, uh, we're the world's largest investor-led initiative promoting responsible investment practices. Uh, we have 2,200 investors in over 50 countries around the world. Uh, collectively managing about $82 trillion in assets under management, so between a third and a half of the world's investable assets, and they commit to responsible investing. So in terms of what the PRI asks of our signatories, and as Amir said, our signatories all sign on to six principles, uh, which really represent best practices around responsible investing. Uh, the principles were um, uh, formulated uh, in 2006 by Kofi Annan, um, at the UN, as well as a group of about 100 uh, founding signatory members. Um, and really, the, the PRI is not prescriptive. So that means that we don't require our signatories to do anything that will limit their investable universe, that will impact the risk-return dynamics, um, or that will natively impact their ability to generate the best possible risk-adjusted returns on behalf of their clients and their beneficiaries. So ESG integration from the PRI's perspective is really just a more comprehensive approach to traditional investment analysis. Uh, it's an approach to investing that aims to incorporate material, environmental, social, and governance factors into investment decisions to better manage risk and to generate sustainable long-term returns. It's something that can and should be pursued even by investors whose sole purpose is to generate financial returns because it argues that to ignore ESG factors is to ignore risks and opportunities that really have a material impact uh, on the returns delivered to clients and beneficiaries. And importantly, responsible investment, like I said, doesn't require divestment from, from any security or from any company, but it simply involves consistently and systematically including ESG information into investment decision making to ensure that all relevant factors are, in, are, are accounted for when you're assessing your risk and return. In addition to ESG integration, our signatories um, incorporate ESG and, and undertake responsible investing through what we refer to as active ownership. 
So incorporating ESG issues into engagement activities that range from discussions that PMs, portfolio managers and analysts have with companies, uh, incorporating it into due diligence on investments, uh, and incorporating it incorporating it into your proxy voting activities and formalized shareholder resolutions. Mm. Um, so in line, this is also important to, to point out that it's in line with uh, the way the terminology is used by the CFA Institute, um, whom we've partnered with on a lot of uh, ESG initiatives. Thank you so much, Carol. Yep. Let me just underscore something you said. So you said between a third and a half mm -hmm. of global investable assets mm -hmm. are held by your signatories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very substantial. It's true, yeah. And tell us more about them. To what degree are these public funds or government owned or somehow uh, funds with a public mandate? Sure, sure. So we have different categories of signatories, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we have asset owners, which really are the, the allocators of capital. So those include public investment funds, uh, public pension funds. Uh, treasuries, actually treasuries is a brand new category of signatory that we've recently uh, started bringing on board. We have the, the Illinois State Treasury and the Chicago City Treasury have come on board this year as our first ever treasury signatories. Uh, we have uh, corporate uh, pension funds, mm -hmm. uh, endowments, including educational endowments, uh, foundations, and insurance companies. So those are the asset owners. And then we have investment managers, and we have a very broad array of, of uh, types of investment managers in terms of the investment strategies that they undertake and the industries that they invest in. You know, everything from uh, the Black Rocks and the Vanguards of the world, um, index investors, to uh, very small investment managers that might have a very specific mandate, um, hedge funds, and, and everything in between. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And certainly, this is by no means a niche or small. Uh, pool of assets. We're talking about something very central to our. That's right, and that and that's really part of the reason that there has to be that financial argument. So to ask and require our signatories to implement responsible investment practices um, across such a broad array of strategies, it has to be something that's actually helping them, as opposed to compromising their ability to generate the best possible financial returns. Perfect. Thank you. Now, now Ron, if I may ask you. Similarly, around these terms. So, when you hear ESG, what does it mean to you and to the to the stakeholders with whom you interact? And and you have your own terminology around value alignment. Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, I'm going to be the uh, I'm going to be I'm going to play the counterpoint uh, to this and I'm, um, to this conversation. Not because I don't agree with what I think it means. But I want to be clear that, I mean, some of you may have seen uh, in the newspaper in the last couple of weeks, uh, the uh, astrophysicists have finally determined that, in the, that there is a black hole in the center of our galaxy. So there's a black hole in this whole area, which is definitions. The, and I sort of come to it from an asset management background. The people who, large chunks of the people who want to do this deeply believe in this. They're wonderful people, they care deeply, and they want to believe. And on the other hand, if I've got a marketplace where there are those folks, one reaction is, boy, what can I sell them? And what I will, what I will tell you is that when you read the marketing material, um, you will get things like someone, uh, a large uh, uh, investment bank talking about <clears throat> um, impact investing through public funds. Now, I want to tell you something. It's, in, it's, it's, it's impossible. You do not invest. Investing, making public investments through traded funds, the impact of your investment directly will not have an impact on the fund, on the firm. All you're doing is trading secondary stocks or trading one shareholder for another. There's, you may be able to lever other things that go with shareholdings, but that's expensive. And that brings me to the other line that I want to make really clear, uh, which, um, which Carol was very clear about. Um, it's and the distinction is between concessionary and non-concessionary investments. That is, are you going to, is your investment hurdle that you get 
and give up nothing in risk-adjusted returns from adding a, something that you, as Carol puts out, you've probably been doing without a label all along? Um, or are you willing to take are you willing to take a reduction in your return because you think you want, uh, you think uh, that it's worthwhile? One, an easy way to see this is a, a bunch of uh, looking across the large public, the large private foundations. And they're quite explicit about it. There are some groups who only who not only do not make con concessionary investments, they're committed to the notion that they can generate alpha. <coughs> Uh, through doing this, there are other funds that explicitly are making concessionary uh, investments uh, because they think it's worthwhile investing in creating these. In, in creating these, and to see this for a moment, think of a think of a foundation that makes that's making a grant. The Rockefeller Foundation makes a grant. It's just a hundred percent. It's just a hundred percent concessionary investment. So um, it becomes, in my mind, very, very critical to make, to be specific. And I, su I suspect I'm going, to, I'm going to be a nag about being more specific than any set of definitions that can operate across a range of people um, that, Carol, that Carol's got to operate with. So and the, re and the, the reason for this fussiness, and I'll, I acknowledge it, is the only critical to asset management is measurement. And if you can't define it, you can't measure it. And you can't, if you can't define what it is you think you're, what impact you think you're having, then you can't measure it. If you think you're willing to make certain levels of concession, if you don't know what the, if, you're not, if you can't quantify the trade-off, then you can't measure what you're doing. And in the end, asset management is about measuring. Whatever it is you think you're accomplishing with it, if you can't measure it, uh, it won't work. And I'll, get, I'll, I'll stop this with, with an example. Uh, TPG, enormously successful private equity fund firm, uh, has brought out in the last, um, I guess it's in the last two years, uh, a something like a six billion dollar impact investment fund that's co-sponsored with Bono. Great. The structure is pretty much the same, right? Two percent, two percent annual, twenty percent carry. The idea is you're doing it's an impact investment fund, so you're doing it's not just financial. You're also committed to generating impact. One guess. How much of the carry is, is results from the financial performance of the fund, and how much is how much is geared to the measured impact that the fund has? Any idea? Any guesses? It's exactly what it is. It's a hundred zero, which is a, which is, to my knowledge, true of ever, all of the large funds and the ones that I see where there's an effort are small for I think I think for very good reasons but my point and where I'll probably be is that we're talking about investment in the end we're talking about measurement because otherwise we can't evaluate what our managers are doing along either dimension thanks Vaughn. we'll certainly come back to, to a great deal of what you said let me ask the one specific question, if I may. So Carol mentioned having many managers in the network who commit to the principles and would call themselves ESG investors. Is that uh, reasonable? ESG integrated. ESG integrated investors. Mm -hmm. When you hear a manager position itself as an ESG integrated investor, how do you respond to that? Well, if we're if we're talking about non-concessionary, mm -hmm. non-concessionary, um, I think of them. Um, well, two things. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, let me give an example. Uh, people who, uh, um, analysts who are in, uh, are in the energy sector and recognize that if you hold a lot of coal assets or you happen to 
still have an operating nuclear plant, there's an issue of stranded assets, and so you better re be sensitive to the risks that uh, to the risks that operating that running assets that are subject to re future regulation because of climate change peak your own that you're doing you're doing a good job uh, in managing uh, in managing your portfolio. Uh, no concessions, but why is this risk any different than any other risk? Now, Carol has made a good point when we were talking before. Um, you might have a sense that we actually didn't do a very good job uh, of managing this before and reminding people that the, uh, these risks are real uh, is important. So I, I react that the, the, the governance component has always puzzled me because most of what I think of as good corporate governance ends up uh, exposing management to the capital market and management typically responds, oh, you're making me operate, run it, manage in the short run. So how you, how you integrate the governance part, I, mean, I, I guess if it were up to me, I'd probably carve the governance unit out altogether. Got it. Uh, but, but they're good, man I want to, I want, they're good managers. Um, they claim to ha have a specific kinds of expertise. I want to know, I want to be able to measure that because by and large, unless it's an index fund, the ESG funds are expensive. Perfect. Well, thank you. Now, Carol, over to you. And I know, I know you want to react to, to Ron's comments. Uh, in addition to that, if you could share with us your signatories, what, what benefits do they see of ESG integration? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with uh, most everything Ron said, actually. I think it's just uh, coming down to, again, um, terminology. So when it comes to impact investing, I absolutely agree. You know, investors are looking for a double bottom line return. They should not only be measuring the financial return, but they should be measuring uh, the social impact as well. There should be a way to quantify it. You know, what what, what gets uh, measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. um, I completely agree with that. Um, I also think that in terms of ESG integration, which I would you know make a distinguishment in a sense that ESG integration, from the standpoint of what we're asking our signatories to commit to. It is really socially neutral. You, they're doing this, you know, whether or not their sole pursuit is financial returns, this makes sense. It makes sense to think about material issues in the context of the industry and the company that you're investing in. Ron brought up, brought up the example of uh, fossil fuel investments, but there are ESG issues that are specifically relevant to every industry and every, every company. Um, a lot of this has been done historically by analysts in terms of what the PRI asks them. Um, we ask them to do it in a standardized way, in a systemic way across their investment process. And increasingly over time, you're seeing that uh, investment analysts and portfolio manage managers are recognizing the material signif significance of these ESG issues on the performance of their portfolios and wanting to measure that associated risk, whereas maybe historically they haven't done that quite as well. Um, in terms of how you measure the value of ESG integration, you know, that's certainly also something that investment managers and investors um, are, are attempting to do in terms of performance attribution. You know, one of the easiest ways to understand the value of ESG integration oftentimes is in the negative. Um, if you're invested in a company where you haven't done that analysis, where you haven't been able to recognize maybe that they have unsafe work practices, um, unsafe practices in some dimension or poor ESG practices, and they get into a negative ESG incident, like for example, uh, British Petroleum and the Deepwater Horizon drilling incident, you see what happens you know, very obviously to the share price, to the performance of the company in terms of fines, uh, increased regulation going forward. Then it becomes painfully obvious what the financial costs are um, of not having mm -hmm. invested the time and effort to really understand these practices. Um, and so I think that there's, there's a component of measure, measurement in ESG integration <laughs> as well. Um, you asked the question of, uh, from our signatory standpoint, you know, what's the benefit of doing this? Um, well, it's just, just those things. It's managing the risk associated with the portfolios. Um, in some cases, the ability to identify opportunities for alpha by understanding uh, companies with business models that are doing particularly well in a certain dimension, outperforming their peers, and therefore might be a better investment opportunity. Um, and then irrespective of whether your objective is uh, primarily returns driven or, uh, or otherwise, ESG integration creates this natural alignment with the broader objectives of society. If as a portfolio manager, as an analyst, 
you're asking companies questions about their business model, about how they're accounting for ESG factors, about how they're incorporating these material factors into their business processes, and you're encouraging them to make improvements on these issues, um, you're driving positive progress. So I think even in some respects, even tying to the comment about impact in public equity, uh, through those engagement activities, you can actually drive impact and, and progress even in the context of public equities. Th thanks, Carol. So you're making a, a case, if I've understood correctly, that ESG integration is good, it's good investing, it's sound investing, yep. it's sound risk mismanagement. Mm -hmm. You've also mm -hmm. said that your signatories are not asked to trade off any return mm -hmm. uh, because, again, it's sound investment, it's good risk management. Yep. Do you have any signatories who go beyond that mm -hmm. and say that they would be willing, concessionary to use Ron's term, or willing to forego some return for principals? And if so, who are they and, and what motivates them? Yep, yep. So you know, you can imagine with, with the number of uh, investors that we have within our uh, network, there are absolutely investors that go, go beyond the ESG integration into the impact investing. Uh, we have, for example, uh, a number of faith-based investors uh, who might be making, uh, you know, exclusions on the basis of the business models that might not align with their moral values. Uh, and then we have uh, impact investors that, that are seeking that, that double bottom line. And we also, you know, important to note that we support those investors as well um, in, in their impact investing activities. Lovely. Thank you. Now, Ron, you previously referred to the asset owners or the investors being genuinely concerned about these issues, wanting to see social good, et cetera. So presumably one of the benefits that they see in this form of investment is, is to align with their values. What other benefits do you see the investors seeking from this? And related to that, how would, should managers responsibly respond to that and provide the investors what they're looking for when it comes to social outcomes? The, um, we're talking, uh, in general, about public, uh, about public, public settings, mm -hmm. um, because that that shifts dramatically if you're talking about uh, la public large large institutions, whether public, private, True. or mm -hmm. founded. That's one set of circumstances. Sure. If you're also talking about uh, individual investors, people who are investing in uh, in mutual funds and whatever, um, you're talking about something different as well. And across the board, because if I, uh, if I uh, sit down with, as, I've, as I have, uh, let's take BlackRock, um, the largest asset manager uh, in the world. Um, I understand that um, what I don't essentially get is beyond what a portfolio manager is doing, but the portfolio manager isn't doing anything uh, in an index fund. So the response is, well, we're gonna we're gonna be stewards. The term uh, starts with the Britain. It's 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 very high on my list of empty uh, of entirely empty terms. I've got five thousand companies. What does it mean to be a steward for 5,000 companies? Now, I can do what CalPERS did years ago, and I can just run performance screens. If I'm being a steward with respect to other things, then I've got to have something to run the screen against, which means I've got to be able to define it. Which the <clears throat> It's not obvious to me. And you may have noticed that BlackRock announced that at the same time, literally, one day after the other, they announced that they were hiring a bunch of people, like a hundred more people, in the business to be uh, to operate in their um, in their engagement. And they fight at the same time. They I forget whether it was sixty or ninety of their active managers, and replaced them with people who were doing algorithms. You can't, and I understand the motivation behind doing both. But they're utterly contradictory, and so I'm, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I want to figure out if I'm going to adjust for it. 
just exactly what am I going to do? So um, do I tell folks that I'm not going to invest in guns? Um, you're going to get arbitrage. I mean, there's, there's no return to that. It's going to get arbitraged away. But remember, here the regulatory structure gets really, really important. On the one hand, um, if, you're, if you're BlackRock, you're running a lot, of, uh, a lot of small pension funds, all of which are subject to regulation under the, uh, under the uh, ERISA, which flatly prohibits any expenditure on funds that isn't directly, related, isn't directly uh, return related. So what do I do? How much, if I'm, going to, uh, if I'm going to manage this and I'm going to be serious about it, it's going to cost me money. And BlackRock's business model is going to get involved in that. If you're running essentially a zero management fee, it becomes hard to imagine what the stewardship is, is supposed to what the stewardship is supposed to involve in terms of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis when the hundred people that you've hired show up at work and you're going to tell them what to do. So, so in your view, let me see if I've understood correctly. So <clears throat> ESG integration requires active management? Well, if I'm... <laughs> I can run index, I can design index quality, index uh, ESG um, constrained index funds, mm -hmm. provided I've got information that I actually trust mm -hmm. and I don't end up looking at a marketplace from the advisor's point of view where I've got a whole bunch of funds, each of whom is using the, their, own, uh, their own devised index. And so there's no, my marketplace can't compare I uh, can't compare among, uh, uh, among the funds. Um, it's, um, it, comes, it comes back to where it's, I don't know how to integrate measurement into an ESG setting other than, in effect, to say, what, you'd really, what I'd really like to see the, uh, the marketing material say is like three sentences. E, in the world we live in, ESG present ESG issues, and particularly ENS issues, prevent serious present important business-related risks and important potential returns. We do a very good job of evaluating those when we assess our view of the company's uh, of the company's uh, value, and we manage our portfolio being. A disciplined about those risks like every other risk. And then I'd stop. Staying on the limitations for a minute, that you, you made a very powerful statement before about public equity markets. And the view, if I understood correctly, was that it is impossible to create social impact in public markets. Is that what you meant? I, I may have overstated it just a little. <laughs> okay. but, but I said, that is, um, if I came at this on a um, on kind of a, on a factor uh, on a factor based asset pricing model, and it turns out that there was really a very very large chunk of capital market investors who valued that that is who treated it returns and liquidity and care about, and will in effect take a concessionary return, then in that certain sense, and I. I not only haven't tried, but lack the skills to begin to model what that, what the distribution has to be to do that. Um, then, in that circumstance, you can imagine there being an impact. But short of that, which I view as almost a corner solution, um, I, just, I don't understand. You're trading one shareholder for another shareholder. You'll end up with with investment clientels like tax clientels. Uh, and whatever whatever particular investors care about will get arbitraged will just get arbitraged away. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I know one uh, one example uh, of of how you could do it, um, and it's 
it's, it involves a mutual fund that I'm involved, uh, I'm involved with, but it's a peculiar story. Uh, the family that founded it was enormously successful um, in its early years in very undisciplined management, but they made a lot of money. And both the husband and the wife who were involved uh, both, uh, uh, both um, developed cancer and both survived. And they took about three and a half or four billion dollars. And uh, in the stock of the asset manager, and created an absolutely first-rate cancer research institute in Kansas City. The Cancer Research Institute has a roughly 45% of the profits of the advisor. If you invest in this fund, what you can say with some confidence is that whatever the management fee is, 40% of that profit is going to go to cancer research. It's got nothing to do with investment. It reflects the coincidence of some rich people who turned it kind of into a foundation. But I can measure this. It's the only circumstance that I can think of where you can really genuinely directly measure it. And then I. Well, thanks so much, Ron. Carol, over to you in terms of the limitations. Do you see any limitations on the social impact that investors can have? And if so, how should those be communicated to align expectations between asset owners and the managers who are rep making representations about social benefit? Sure. Um, well, first, if, if it would be okay, I'd just like to respond to the point about um, index investors, uh, the Black Rocks, mm -hmm. the Vanguards, sure. and the State Streets of the world, collectively the, uh, the top three biggest index um, owners. And given the fact that the market uh, the equity investment market is really shifting towards um, index investment. Um, they own a very significant percentage of the overall market. So, you know, how do you define an, inde in, an index investor? Um, if, if you own a, a large index, you essentially own the entire market. Uh, what does that mean? It means that if one company in your investment portfolio is generating negative externalities, it's going to negatively impact mm -hmm. another company in your portfolio. Okay, so you've got essentially risk exposure to the entire market and every ESG issue. Um, what else defines an index investor? Um, you're not an active investor in a sense that you're constrained. You have to replicate that index. You don't have the ability to make buy and sell decisions based on your perceived value of the individual security. You have to replicate the index. So there has been a big shift it's, you know, fairly re recently within the past couple of years where the index investors have decided okay, uh, what should our engagement activities be? Um, and to Ron's point about uh, BlackRock hiring uh, you know, very substantially more people on their governance and engagement team. And why might they be doing that? Why might they be thinking about that from a strategic standpoint? Well, they've decided you know, we're constrained in terms of our ability to make investment choices in the context, in the context of these index portfolios. But we've decided that we're still responsible where we can for managing the risk associated with uh, the investments. We're responsible for our clients to, to, to managing the risk to the extent that we're able to do that. They're in a unique situation since they own such a very substantial portion of every outstanding uh, company, but they have a lot of leverage. They have the ability to vote their proxies on these ESG issues, and if they want to, they can have substantial leverage and have substantial impact um, encouraging companies to make positive changes in these areas. So steward can be you know, a confusing term. You know, again, I would go back to the fact that doing this does create this natural alignment with the broader objectives of society. But they're very squarely doing this from a risk management perspective. They're doing this in line with their ability to generate the best possible risk-adjusted returns for their, uh, for their clients in the context of how they're able to do that in their index portfolios. I'd come up with a, a similar example from the asset owner perspective. If you're one of the world's largest public pension funds, CalPERS, CalSTRS, uh, GPIF in Japan, you know, some of the largest investors who, again, essentially own the entire market, you're facing the same situation, where if one company in your portfolio is generating these negative externalities that they might not be paying for in their business model, it's going to be negatively impacting something else in your portfolio. And at the, the macro level as well, you know, these issues have the ability not only to affect individual companies, individual securities, 
but they can in fact affect the stability of the overall market. So of course, when you make investment analysis, you look at the macro and you look at the micro level risk associated with an investment. So these are really the reasons why the index investors are pursuing these strategies and why the, you know, the, what we call the universal owners, um, it makes financial sense for them to be doing this. Um, and to your question, uh, the question about what types of uh, risks and lim limitations there are, Oh, you know, well, there, there are things to consider. You know, if you want to undertake a responsible investment strategy, there are resource requirements, you know, whether those be investments that you need to make uh, to get additional data, you know, to be incorporating a broader set of investment uh, factors into your investment analysis, um, allocating resources, whether that be hiring 100 people on the governance team or hiring some people that specifically focus on ESG or even educating your portfolio managers and investment analysts on ESG issues. There's a cost associated with that. There's a resource demand. Uh, so that needs to be acknowledged. Um, yes, yeah, so I would say that, that would, that's a major, a major consideration. Great. Now, I want to know, I, I sense you want to jump in there. If I could just stay with Carol for a couple more Please. minutes uh, <laughs> on this. Um, Carol knows things, <laughs> and I'm, you know, <laughs> so this is important. So Carol, the, we're going to open up soon for comments and questions. I'm sure our, our attendees have a lot to say on these topics. Um, in terms of advice to different stakeholders, so the theme today is about public funds. So starting with public funds, what would you advise them to think about when they look at ESG integration, similarly to managers who are, of course, signatories? And also to all of us as individuals or private investors, uh, what words of advice do you have when it comes to this, this uh, question? Yeah, I mean, you know, start somewhere. You know, we have investors coming to us at the PRI at many different stages of their ESG integration journey. Uh, you know, in terms of what kind of support that we provide them, we put out publications, you know, five or six major publications per year looking at ESG integration, the how-to of ESG integration across different asset classes, investment categories, um, as well as looking at the individual ESG issues, educating uh, investors on the materiality of those ESG issues and helping them understand how they, they can incorporate those issues into their uh, engagement activities. So I would say, certainly you can sign up to the PRI. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise against that. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, utilize the resources that are out there, whether it's PRI or other organizations like US SIF series or many organizations operating in, that, in this space. You know, we collaborate uh, pretty extensively as well. Utilize the resources that are out there and available to you. Um, talk to your peers. You know, certainly one of the, uh, the biggest um, points of advantage to the PRI, aside from the resources that we provide in terms of content, events, and, and people, are the fact that you get to engage with this global signatory base uh, to not only understand kind of what the current thinking is on these issues uh, globally, share best practices with your peers, et cetera, but also you have the ability to the extent that you want to influence the market to kind of contribute your voice contribute your voice to the direction of development on ESG issues. Um, so I would say whether that be through the PRI, whether that be um, through your own other channels, talk to your peers, find out what they're doing, find out what works for them, find out what doesn't work for them. Um, yeah. Those Lovely. Th thank you. Uh, Ron, same question to you, uh, which would be advice to stakeholders, public, uh, so managers of public funds, I want to I want to separate out something that we we spoken in a phone call earlier, which is, um, what do you do? How how carefully are you on concessionary and non consensual consensual when you're a pension fund? And I'm really straight. If you're a private pension fund governed by ERISA, there's no you don't have any choice. But Calpers, the large public funds aren't governed by ERISA. Uh, CalPERS has a history of um, making uh, unusual investments uh, which are presented as ESG investments that have been disasters. The impact, the social impact of CalPERS not performing well are bankrupt cities in California because it generates, and it also creates, uh, it creates, how shall I put it, 
um, lying by public institutions when they identify what return they're expecting in the future, which frankly, if all of us could get that, we'd jump at it in a second. But the reason they're doing it, and they know they're not telling the truth, is because if they lower the expected return, it increases the amount that every city in California pays into their pension fund and diverts assets from the pension fund to something else. So the public funds, as a matter of principle, shouldn't be any different uh, than private funds. Now, I made a little bit, I, I took BlackRock a little lightly, and I don't mean to, because they actually did, they've been doing some things which seem to me exactly what you would, if you were an index investor, what you would do in order to improve ESG performance across the whole portfolio. Um, two years ago was the first time that BlackRock voted against the, a manager's, a management's position on an ESG off issue. It was accidental petroleum. The structure of that, of the proxy proposal made by the environmentalists was very carefully done. What they wanted the company to commit to was on an annual basis a careful evaluation of ESG, let's say ESG, of ES, ES issues on their business strategy going forward. Mm -hmm. Now that strikes me is exactly what you do if you were an index fund because what you would like, to, the more informationally efficient the market, the more you're protecting investors in an index mm -hmm. fund yep. against, un, and, and BlackRock has been very good about that. They're quite clear that when it's an issue of, uh, when it is an issue of information, they're willing to force the company to spend all the money the company says they're going to have to spend if they do this because it's a, it provides a payoff mm -hmm. to their investors. You may end up with prices that reflect these kinds of risks, which does affect an index fund. So mm -hmm. on the other hand, I don't know why that takes 100 people to do. Uh, and so I'm still wondering what it is that 100 people do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of ESG yeah. issues. But, but in terms of disclosure requirements, you're you're all for that. Um, I, what I'm what I'm for is that um, uh, sustainable accounting, mm -hmm. um, generate generating information that an asset manager, a portfolio manager, can deal with in order to assess these to in order to assess these risks. Market efficiency isn't free. Mark information isn't free, but if you're in that the information, which is basically just collectivizing uh, the information search, and then it becomes a sensible thing for a uh, for a steward who has a large enough portfolio that um, that for all sorts of reasons I can't gauge with everybody. But that struck me from BlackRock's perspective, though I'm not sure they presented it that way, yeah. as a really it is Good a really idea. sensible. Uh, a really sensible way of yeah. concern about that. And in fact, I would say, you know, specifically looking at those shareholder resolutions happening around uh, encouraging or insisting that companies report to investors on their risk exposure to climate change risk, risk specifically, which is what the, uh, mm -hmm. the Occidental uh, Petroleum yep. um, proposal was about. Yeah, for the first time ever, now the biggest investors in the world, the, the largest uh, stakeholders or ownership stakeholders in these companies are getting on board and for the first time ever really supporting uh, voting against management in many of these cases. And that really has been the differentiating factor that's allowed there to be enough critical mass to, to force these companies now to, to listen in, in the case of Occidental and then subsequently uh, the case with ExxonMobil where they've now reported on their um, climate change risk exposure. I mean, I will say that the reports that they came out with were less than um, satisfactory for a lot of invest investors. There's still a tremendous uh, amount that needs to be done more for there to be really adequate um, uh, disclosure for companies so that investors can take that information and use it in, 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 a, in a useful way in their investment modeling. 
um, but, but it's been tremendously important. I'll also say, just kind of commenting in terms of the public funds, it's true they're not regulated by, by, by ERISA as corporate pension funds would be, but ERISA is, is, is a guideline that they look towards and it's something that's really widely followed. So even though they might not specifically be regulated by ERISA, it is something they, they look to as a benchmark and it's very important for the public funds um, you know, in terms of looking at the direction in addition to the direction that they're given by the Department of Labor. Um, and I'll just make the point uh, in the case, for example, with CalPERS, there was an instance where they looked at the portfolio returns as a result of not investing in, um, I believe it was cigarette companies. So I'll make the point, and you hear this all the time in investments, you know, if uh, an institutional investor or an individual investor talks to their financial advisor, or even on television when you see a commercial for a financial advisor, they'll always say that past performance does not guarantee future results. Right. So one thing that happens a lot in the finance sector is that returns, uh, you know, a story can be told and you can put together the financials over a certain time period looking at a specific subsector really to tell the story that you want to tell. Um, and so it can be easy to kind of manipulate results looking at a specific time period, et cetera, um, to make results look bad. You know, that's not to say for, with the example of cigarette companies, for example, Maybe over the past several years, they've benefited, for example, through expansion in the emerging markets, you know, selling cigarettes to children. You know, this has led to profits. But who's to say that over the next 10 years that that might be different, that in those countries where they're, in, you know, Indonesia and the like, where they're selling these cigarettes very profitable, um, that there won't be an increasing level of social awareness um, that makes these companies lose their social, social uh, right to operate. It leads to decreased demand, et cetera. Um, so, so again, just point to the fact that past performance does not guarantee future results, and I think that this is very important in the context of fossil fuel investments as well when you're looking at concepts like stranded asset theory. Uh, just because energy companies over a certain time period may or may not have done well, that doesn't guarantee that in the future um, other alternative energy sources will become cheaper, become more viable, make the business models of the fossil fuel producers less viable over the long term. Um, and make them less profitable. So just pointing, pointing that out there Thank as well. you, Carol. So, so we have 20 more minutes, uh, and I definitely want to open it. I want to leave a, one minute each for you for closing remarks at the very end, but now want to take questions and comments from the floor. So first, if I may ask you if you could raise your hands if you've got a comment, uh, and we can see how many we have. So one here, are there, are there others? Two, uh, three. So what, let's, if you can hold yours for now, let's start with one, uh, two and then three over here in the front row. So ma'am, if you could start with yours, please. Um, sure, so my question is sort of around measurement. So if you are looking at a particular portfolio company or a particular portfolio manager, and you're trying to measure the impact of you know, certain initiatives that you're doing as, on an ESG kind of basis, on the environmental side, it strikes me that there are some operational efficiencies and things that maybe are a little bit easier to quantify in dollars. On the social side, um, a lot of the benefit seems to come from avoiding negative consequences. So maybe you're ramping up your compliance function or your legal function or your HR function to avoid problems. And I just wonder, how do you think about how companies can, can measure whether their social initiatives are having an impact on you know returns, basically? Lovely. Let's hear the three questions and then respond collectively. Uh, so, Sert, your question. Uh, my, my question is very related mm -hmm. uh, because he kept talking about measurement being a problem, mm -hmm. which I agree with. Uh, but I also know that there are these uh, tools and frameworks being developed like carbon pricing or like the sustainability accounting standards board that's designing quantitative metrics for ESG. Um, and again, I, I agree that lack of measurability is still a problem. So what is the disconnect between these tools and frameworks being developed versus what's actually happening in the market? Lovely. And we'll hear from you in the front row. Hey, uh, my name is Simon. First of all, thank you three for coming to speak with all of us. And uh, I just couldn't help but notice Carol's uh, button for SDGs. I love it. I'm on the board for UNA and do volunteer work for the UN, so thank you for that. And uh, speaking of the UN and kind of global things in general. Can you read louder, please? Uh, sure, sure. You mentioned, I believe, a fund or something from Japan. Um, if you're allowed to speak about this, I'd be interested to hear if you could speak about what regions around the world are kind of the easiest to work with in your network and which ones are the most difficult. Great. 
So let's start with Carol then, and then hear Ron on, on the three questions. Yep, yep. So talking about your question, I would still again just make that distinction between ESG being utilized as kind of a risk management framework as opposed to the, uh, to the metrics. And there are a lot of uh, frameworks that are being put in place, both in terms of um, determining what kind of data should be reported by companies, such as the SASB, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board Framework, which is excellent. We work together with them quite a bit. Um, referring to this PIN, the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly since the PRI originated uh, with Kofi Annan at the UN, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals themselves are being used as a useful framework as you try to solve that problem. Um, how do we measure impact? How do we kind of generate scale on these investments by coming up with a, you know, a, a useful methodology to measure the impact from investments? And so the Sustainable Development Goals themselves have emerged as a useful framework to kind of map the, imp the impact of investments in companies um, on a host of issues that collectively contribute to the the general concept of alleviating poverty. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the, the third question. Oh, GPIF. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so GPIF, actually the, the world's uh, largest public fund uh, in Japan. Uh, Hiro Matsuno, uh, the CIO, is actually on the PRI's board of directors. Um, and the work that he's done within that fund and GPIF as a leader has really I would say moved the market forward, not only within Asia, within Japan, where you've seen other investors kind of following suit on issues like engagement, but they've had a much broader impact within the overall market, just given the size of their investment portfolio. They're not only influencing Asia, but they're really influencing the world globally. And I'd say that their CIO in particular has really been a very vocal public <coughs> leader speaking around the world on these issues and, and helping investors understand that this is something that not only does it create that alignment and create that alignment with the broader objectives of society, but it's something that will, it has the ability to support your portfolio performance. Um, in terms of other regions, you know, the PRI started in London. Um, some of the initial founding signatories that were the most active and most actively engaged, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, were in places like Northern Europe, the Nordic region, uh, the Benelux region. And these investors, I would say, continue to kind of be on the cutting, the cutting edge in terms of how to do this, how to integrate it into investment practices, and how to align it with, uh, with social objectives as well. Lovely. One? Um, the, the strategy side and the measurement side. Um, <coughs> Much more development of data. I want to talk for just a second about that. Um, and in this, uh, and I also want to talk about two things: uh, the jointness of both costs and revenues, and the one hand, and and how you go about thinking about what what it is you want to disclose through accounting standards. And basically, on both of them, um, in most in most circumstances, when there's jointness, there isn't any way. Um, to allocate them. It kind of depends why you're asking. Um, the same thing with, uh, to the extent that sustainable accounting standards are mimicking um, uh, international accounting standards or, uh, or the U.S., uh, my own view is that I don't want any principles. What I want is raw data because every investor is going to have a different way of looking at the data and to the extent that the numbers that are published reflect a set of assumptions about costs more generally, just give me, just disclose the numbers and let everybody mix and match them as, respon as, it is, as responsive to their own um, to their own concern. We're a long way from uh, we're a long way from that. Um, the more, the better. I'd rather have. More information. Uh, I'd rather have more information from the less. And you can begin to think that as you begin creating lots of detailed data, that the potential for using big data, uh, big data approaches to be able to understand this stuff better uh, than we're doing, because we're, st we're still getting lumpy data, and we're st which doesn't lend itself to it. There's a future that maybe uh, there's a future that may solve a good deal of our problems, but I mean, on the strategy, on the company strategy side, there isn't any way to show, to quantify the jointness, but that's management. 
that is, that it's the exercise of judgment about knowing your market, knowing your, uh, knowing how you manufacture things, what your inputs are like, and you're making you're making assumptions about jo about jointness all the time, even if you can't formally um, be able to to divide them. So, um, more data. Uh, and management that's self-conscious about it will will do a better job with this, just like we'll do a better job with everything else if we know more and we're more deep and we're more uh, and we're more careful about it. Lo lovely. So let's take th three more. So I saw w one over there. Uh, so we'll take one, two, three, please, if we could. So we'll start with the gentleman in the scarf and the lady here, and you, sir, in the blue shirt. Well, I have two questions for Carol. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to understand the working of the PRI. Um, tax evasions has become like a big menace these days. And I was recently reading the report of Oxfam how big pharma companies are evading taxes and how it has a negative impact in developing countries. So you talked about negative externalities. Do you consider tax evasion or avoidance as a negative externality? And my second question is, uh, uh, how do you monitor the compliance of the signatories? Is it completely based on good faith or there is some monitoring mechanism also? Thank you. Yes? Yeah, very similar to what he said. My name is Chadvi, and my question is about how do you bring about transparency in what people are reporting? Um, because a lot of companies, be it asset managers or even large corporations, are jumping on an ESG bandwagon mm -hmm. because it's just the cool thing to be. But um, so are they really doing it? Are they whitewashing, greenwashing, or are they really having ESG in their processes and systems? How do we check that and how do you manage that? Thank you. The gentleman, please share. So, yeah, I think, uh, Ron, uh, you know, in terms of my head, you appeal to your argument appeals to me. In terms of my heart, I think Carol wins the day. <laughs> I hope I win the but both I'm sides. Say, so I'm about to say, I wonder if there's not something in between uh, on this. So, basically, you're saying there's kind of an equilibrium out there, and you can chop and dice these things as much as you want, but at the end of the day, things still pretty much stay the same, if I understand you correctly, Ron, on this. Um, but, you know, I kind of wonder, you know, whether you did the analysis fully, you know, because the art people, I think, in this room and elsewhere actually do care in their, in their overall assessment of their investments about some of the externalities which Carol referred to, but, you know, uh, we're, it's, not just, it's not just how firms view the externalities, it's also how the consumer the investor actually sees it as well. Mm -hmm. And we, there are consumption-based theories of investment, as you know. And, and, in that, uh, and in that case, I should certainly put some of my money into supporting firms which makes you know, the probabilities of having a healthy and long life greater than, 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 other, than otherwise. Now, well, that seems to be maybe trivial. But then I kind of wonder, like, well, you know, there's a market for that. If you believe in financial innovation, and I know, I know you don't believe in financial innovation. <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, you know, you come up with this structured financing thing where you got people who, you know, are willing to put, to kind of bear the, the first impact risk, and it's not social impact, first impact risk issues. And then the rest of the market takes a look at it and says, oh, well, since they're willing to get a lower, a lower return, you know, even, more, even while taking higher risk, which is kind of a bizarre thing to do, but they're willing to do that. Well, then they have kind of made it more attractive for me to invest in this particular firm, right? And so you do get an outcome where you kind of perhaps increase the pie of the people willing, uh, who are find financial terms, uh, financial interests alone, to invest in those particular companies. And you can separate these things out so you don't have to mix everything up like the way you're doing. You got the social investor getting some security, and you got the financial person getting some security, and everyone's happy at the end of the day they got exactly what they want. So, so what's wrong with that? So, 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 yeah, let's start with Ron. I'm and just going to come back to no? this because it's kind Please. of fun. Um, there's nothing wrong. No, no. Um, so one, of course, you, of course, people believe in innovation because we've got a. They may not believe in linear innovation. They may believe in financial markets in punctuated, uh, uh, in punctuated uh, 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 innovation because. That would have ex explained the crash phenomenon, but I, but which what, what you're just what you're describing in sort of uh, in uh, in popular terms is you're you're describing factor investment, and I don't see any reason in the world why I might not personally be perfectly happy to take a 
take my return, some of it in financial terms and some of it because I care about the world my grandchildren are going to live in. Perfect, and it's, a, it's perfectly sensible. Whether it has whether it has an impact on the stock price across most range, my belief, but you, is that it won't until you end up with a significant enough group of investors who will no longer view good good environmental, good social things as consumption. They will view it as part of the return they get because they care about it. In that circumstance, of course, uh, it'll have an of course it'll have an impact, and it'll be a, and it'll be a positive thing. I just think we're a, I think we're a long way from the setting in which if I break if if what I do is I go to people and I say, look, here's the return you can expect. What you're going to see is that it's 30 basis points lower than what compare what competitive funds would do. Here's what you're getting for the 30 basis points. I can tell you what we do differently, and I'm going to give you numbers. I think I could sell that fund. I could, I'd have to sell it at the kind of individual level. I couldn't sell it in, uh, to an ERISA. I mean, I'd, I'd have to worry my way around the, uh, around the regulation. But I think that's a, I think that's a saleable fund. Um, and if I, if, if I suddenly start doing that and I gather enough assets across the economy, then yes, it'll affect the stock price. Yeah. And I would say, with, if I could just Please. respond with respect to ESG integration. So your portfolio manager... You're assessing whether or not to make an investment. Uh, you have, uh, you know, an expected race, rate of return based on your, you know, va your valuation of the business model, et cetera. Um, and then I say to you, okay, but have you appropriately considered the following ESG issue? And the PM says, oh, you know, I didn't really think about that. Now I'm going to incorporate this, think about this additional risk um, and how it impacts the financial prospects of that company and how that might impact the valuation. Um, and in some cases, the answer might be, okay, now I've incorporated, maybe you've adjusted the discount rate you're using, you've adjusted, adjusted the multiple you're using, depending on your valuation model, and you might decide, you know, yes, I'm being compensated for that risk in my expected return, in which case you're going to continue to hold that investment, or you're going to make that investment decision, or maybe the answer is no, and you'll, you'll not make that investment. But I guess the point being um, is that ESG is just a way to incorporate that additional, more comprehensive risk assessment in your investment modeling. Um, and now just to mm -hmm. respond to some of the questions that have been asked, I think there was a question about tax avoidance. Uh, yeah, tax avoidance is, is an issue that's being looked at um, under the realm of governance, generally speaking, uh, and under the umbrella of corruption. Uh, whether tax avoidance is something that generates a ex negative externality that can impact um, the market. So that's absolutely something that I think is relevant that's being, there's a lot of attention being paid at the PRI and other places around tax avoidance. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Second part related to, uh, what, uh, is there a compliance mechanism whereby you are monitoring your signatories? Right, right, and that tied to your question as well. So um, all of our signatories on an annual basis goes through uh, a PRI reporting process where between January and March of each year, they go online and answer a pretty substantial uh, set of questions about exactly what they're doing to integrate ESG across their portfolio. Uh, there are two outputs of uh, that annual reporting. One is, is private and one is public. Um, and interestingly, even the private report is something that an asset owner, so for example, a public fund, an endowment, or a foundation that might be awarding a mandate to an investment manager might make a request to see their full private reporting in addition to the public reporting that's available. And that really gives them the ability to see beyond kind of the glossy marketing materials and kind of just that stamp that you're a PRI signatory and look into a much greater degree of detail as to what they're actually doing in their ESG integration efforts. And so we have uh, something called a data portal where our signatories can go in and really automates that process of making those requests 
to see that reporting, and we're really educating our asset owners, the allocators of capital, in the selection appointment and monitoring process and how to use those reports, how to understand those reports, and how to integrate that in your investment decision making. So that really creates a, a mechanism of accountability and a way for um, the consumers, the asset owners, to uh, actually see beyond um, the statements of some managers who say that they're integrating ESG to see whether they really are, in fact, doing mm -hmm. that effectively. Wonderful. Juan, you wanted to comment on externalities. Mm -hmm. I just want, I wanted to flag something, because we, we talk about externalities as if we really know what we're talking about. And, and across some dimensions, if I'm dumping, you know, if, if I'm dumping uh, uh, the sort of stuff GE was dumping into the Hudson River, I can sort of count that. But I just want to, I just want to suggest it's not any easier to do sophisticated strategy with respect to externalities as it is anything else. And I'm going to, in a world of big data, I'm just going to provide an anecdote. An, a, a good friend of mine who's a world-class mic, microeconomist got hired by McDonald's. And what he's asked to do is, look, we can wrap, we can put hamburgers in cardboard containers or we can put them in the styrofoam containers. We don't much care. Tell us which one is going to have the least environmental impact. And I mean, this, this fellow is unbelievably careful. And he came back and his answer to McDonald's, and I'm sure he charged him a lot of money, and maybe he should have, was there's no way to tell. <laughs> and what he meant was the number of assumptions you had to plug into your model and the variance associated with each of those assumptions left you in a position where you simply couldn't tell. My point is sort of twofold. Uh, one is that it's important to rec recognize that every part of this assessment is complicated and uncertain. And then the other, to come back to something I said before, which meant there's management is judgment. And judgment means you're making decisions based on incomplete information. And there's kind of no way around it. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you don't do it. You just take the best shot you can, and then you, and you may, you, there are ways to deal with it. But I don't want us to think that it's easy to identify what the better practice is just because things are hard. And do you have a closing soundbite for us, closing thoughts before we hear from Carol in terms of the take home message? Look, um, I guess the, uh, I think of it from an investor's, an investor's point of view rather than a, a public agency. Uh, public agencies, um, if you ever want to have fun, take a look at large state pension funds and look at their governance. <laughs> You know, it's sort of the Upton, it's the Upton Sinclair and the sausage making of, uh, of finance. Um, the, it's to, I guess in the end it's measurement. If I am looking at a fund, if the fund, if I'm giving up diversification because they're green. I want to know how much. I want to know that. I want to. I want. I want to back test it. The, and if you want to see how to do it right, the Norwegian State Fund does an extraordinarily careful job of looking at the over time what it costs them to take things out of their portfolio, and it costs them. But they're the sort of things that you take the cost. Uh, in order to do, but in every case, you need to be able to measure. And if somebody had, I mean, here's a great idea for a project, right? You're, you get hired by a large, uh, by a large um, private, equi uh, private equity fund. They want to do, uh, they want to do uh, uh, impact investing. Devise an incentive structure, which in fact measures the impact side as well as the, 
uh, as well as the financial returns and doesn't do it in a fashion which skews your investment decisions towards the kinds of ES elements which are, which are easily measurable. Because the truth is, if they're easily measurable, it's much less likely they'll get taken care of another way. How can you do it in settings where it's really hard to measure it? And if you figure that one out, there are a lot of private equity firms who are going to be really happy to see that. Thanks, Fun. Carol. Yep, yep. Great points, great points. Um, I would say that, you know, in terms of the direction that we would like to see this headed, kind of what the holy grail is, is that this ESG integration um, at a high level uh, really becomes embedded into the traditional investment management process and that the need to kind of re refer to it as something that's delineated and separate uh, goes away and that it entirely just becomes a, a, a part of the standard investment process. And so that's the reason why we work so much together with organizations, uh, standard setting organizations like the CFA Institute, um, as well as with uh, the various business schools, uh, Columbia, my alma mater, um, uh, UPenn, uh, Chicago, kind of the, the standard bearers in terms of what defines traditional investment practice, and that it becomes something that's no longer um, kind of a separate class. And I'll, I'll note that at all of the various top business schools, uh, the sustainable investing classes, just anecdotally, happen to be the most um, sought after classes within the business school curriculum. It's incredible uh, demand at the student level. So we're seeing that within the business schools, the eventual analysts and the portfolio managers, there's a, there's a really strong interest. We would like it to get to the point where there no longer has to be a sustainable investing class. That this just becomes standard part of the corporate finance class, of the investment management mm. class. Um, and, and that's the world we'd eventually like to see. Lovely. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Uh, Kathleen, please close us out. I'd also like to thank Lisa Sachs and her team at Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment for their collaboration. And I'd like to thank Ellen and Adrian and my colleagues for making Thanks. Thank you. Did you enjoy it? Yeah.